The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. This is the flag of Latvia. This nation borders Russia and is one of the three Baltic states in the region. The nation is sandwiched between Latvia and Estonia. For most of the nation's history, it's been under the thumb of the Russian government, and it's been at war with both Germany, Prussia, and Poland. Much of this nation's history and background is tumultuous, and I'm going to begin this video with a story about a man who added to that nation's misfortune. This is Herbert Kuckers. He was born in the city Lipija on May 17, 1900, and at the time of his birth and throughout his childhood, Latvia didn't exist as its own nation. It was under the control of the Russian Empire, and as he grew up, that's all he experienced. Much of his childhood is unknown. What we do know is that when he became an adult, he wanted to pursue a career as a fighter pilot, and throughout his 20s and early 30s, he was able to establish that career. His flying abilities were unmatched compared to his peers, so much so that he was awarded the Harman Trophy for Latvia in 1933. The Harman Trophy is an international award given to people who have displayed outstanding aeronautical ability. And immediately after receiving this award, Herberts became a national hero in Latvia. He was considered the Charles Lindbergh of the Baltic states, especially after he created a wooden aircraft that was able to fly 28,000 miles he visited Japan, China, Indochina, and India. Soon after he received all of his accolades and the love of his entire nation, Herbert Kakurs wanted to further his military career, so he joined the Arajas Commando. This was a National Socialist SS Auxiliary Police Group that was established in Latvia in order to enact horrible things. The occupation of Latvia began in 1941, and the German military and German government didn't waste time trying to take a census on who lives in the nation, whether or not they're an enemy to the German military, or if they can be coaxed and folded into the new German empire. The Arajas Commando, the organization that Herberts quickly joined, was responsible for carrying out some of the most brutal crimes against humanity in history. The unit's primary function on paper is just to be military police. Their actual role was to eliminate the Jewish population in Latvia. Herbert Kukurs, with his background in the Latvian military, quickly became a high-ranking official within the unit and had a hand in establishing and planning two awful atrocities. Herbert Kukurs had the job of managing and liquidating the Riga ghetto. The Riga ghetto housed and imprisoned the majority of the Jewish population that were located in Riga a major city in Latvia. The forceful relocation of Jews into the ghetto began on October 25th, 1941. And eventually, Latvian Jews wouldn't be the only Jews located in the ghetto. German Jews would be deported there, and they would be placed separate from the Latvian Jews into something called the Small Ghetto. And on November 30th and December 8th of 1941, the Rumbla Massacre occurred, when German military officials liquidated the ghetto. And on those two days, approximately 35,000 people were executed. And over the course of the war, more and more people would be sent to the Riga ghetto, and more and more people would be executed. In the book, The Holocaust in Latvia, 1941 through 1945, the Latvian historian Andrew Ezegalis writes that Kokurs played a leading role in the atrocities that were committed in the Riga ghetto in conjunction with the Rumba massacre that occurred on November 30th of 1941. After the war, surviving witnesses of the Rumba massacre reported that Kokurs had been present during the ghetto clearance and fired into the mass of Jewish civilians. According to even more surviving eyewitness accounts, Kukurs was the most recognizable face within the unit responsible for the Rumba massacre. Andrew Ezegalis even notes that the Arajas unit wasn't the only unit present during the Rumba massacre, but the degree they participated in the atrocities in the Riga ghetto were so significant and so devastating that Andrew Ezegalis, after gathering eyewitness accounts and studying the historical and factual accounts of what happened during the Rumba massacre, he concludes that the chief responsibility for said massacre rests on Herbert Kukur's shoulders. And to remind you, the very people that Herbert Kukur's killed, the very people that Herbert Kukur's massacred, were the same ones celebrating him for receiving the Harmon Trophy and becoming the Charles Lindbergh of their nation. He was a national hero, and within years of receiving that award and accepting praise from his fellow countrymen, he would turn around and betray them. 
His crimes included setting the Riga synagogue on fire, executing over 1,200 Jewish civilians, including infants, by forcing them to stand over a lake until exhaustion, where they would fall in and drown. And those 1,200 executions happened in one massacre. He had also kidnapped and sexually assaulted many Jewish girls and young women at the Arajas Commando headquarters, and of course, his worst atrocity, that was committed on November 30th, 1941, where he ordered other members of the Araja Commando to liquidate the Riga ghetto. He took 28,000 people into a forest near Riga and executed them there. Multiple eyewitness accounts from survivors of that massacre reported that they saw Kakurs snatching infants from the arms of their mothers and executing them on the spot. Like many other high-ranking German officials, after the war, Herbert's Kakurs fled to South America, specifically Brazil. The Brazilian consulate in Marcel issued a visa for permanent residency for Kakurs on December 18, 1945. Unfortunately, the visa did not list the name of the Latvian Jewish woman Kakurs kidnapped and pretended was his wife, but it did identify the three minor children that was accompanying him. Once in Brazil, Kakurs established a business in Sao Paulo, flying a Republic RC-3 CBs on scenic flights. And whilst he was running this business and living his life in South America, he never attempted to hide his identity. Neither shame nor guilt motivated him to move to South America. His motivation was even more shallow. He simply didn't want to go to prison. So as a result, he remained in South America for over a decade. And his business was relatively successful, and that success didn't go unnoticed. He would be reached out to by a company interested in purchasing his business. They persuaded him to have a meeting in Uruguay. This is where Herbert's met a businessman named Anton Kunzel, and he was incredibly poised to meet Herbert, but not for the reasons that you think. You see, this whole business meeting was a sham, and the man that Herbert's was speaking to wasn't named Anton. His name was Yaakov Midad and he was an agent of the Israeli Mossad, an organization tasked with the killing of fugitive Nazi war criminals, and Herbert Kerkurs had fallen right into their trap. Yaakov would ultimately coax Herbert into a home that he and other Mossad agents owned. Herbert was under the impression that they were going to still talk money. He was sorely mistaken. Herbert's Kerkurs would quickly be tackled and subdued. Herbert's was in his 60s by now, but he still was strong enough to fight violently against his attackers. At one point, Kakurs bit the finger of one of the hitmen so hard it nearly severed. Ultimately, however, Kakurs was overwhelmed. He was subdued after one of the men hit him in the head with a hammer. Now helpless, Kakurs started pleading with the men to let him speak before they did anything else. He got no response and was promptly shot in the head twice with a suppressed automatic pistol killing him instantly. Herbert Kerkur's body was found in a trunk on March 6th, 1965. There were evidence of multiple post-mortem gunshot wounds to his body, and laying next to his body were several documents pertaining to his involvement in the murder of Jews in the Riga ghetto. This is Lake Victoria. It's the biggest of the African Great Lakes with a surface area of approximately 23,146 square miles. It's the world's largest tropical lake and the world's second largest freshwater lake by surface area after Lake Superior in North America. And unfortunately, on July 11th of this year, tragedy struck concerning this lake. A passenger plane with 43 people on board crashed into Tanzania's Lake Victoria on Sunday before landing in the northwestern town of Bukoba. The accident is being blamed on bad weather. Rescuers worked to recover survivors and lift the plane out of the water using cables and cranes. It is true that there's been an accident in Kagera province, he says, and everything is under control as all rescues and safety equipment have been deployed to help out. We've managed to save quite a number of people and we will give a brief statement after we finish with our rescue efforts. The French-Italian-built ATR-42 plane was operated by Precision Air, which is Tanzania's largest private airline and is partly owned by Kenya Airways and primarily offers flights to tourist destinations. And on July 11th, 2022, during a typical flight from Dar es Salaam to Bakoba, a town on the shores of the lake, the plane suddenly fell out the sky and collided into the lake. The aircraft was approximately 100 meters in the air when the plane began to malfunction. The pilot went on to say that it was bad weather that caused the plane to fall out the sky, but as of right now, the reason is unknown. 43 people, including 39 passengers, and two pilots and two crew members were on the flight. And when the plane collided into the lake, 
this is what the plane looked like after they fished it out of the lake. The entire front of the plane is nearly ripped off, and when the plane collided with the lake, it immediately started taking on water, threatening the lives of everyone inside. The police commander at the scene of the crash mentioned that they were able to save a vast majority of the people, but fatalities are unknown. At least 26 people have been rescued and evacuated to a hospital. The rest, their conditions are unknown. This is Enoatak Atoll. It's a collection of 40 islands with a total land area of 5.85 square kilometers, or 2.26 square miles. And it was the location of the Battle of Enoatak. This island battle was the epicenter of the Pacific Campaign during World War II, and the battle was fought between the 17th of February 1944 and the 23rd of February 1944. The Japanese Empire stationed around 2,300 men on the island, with the intention of using that island as a base for the Japanese Empire to regain lost islands that were captured by the Americans in the Pacific, and the invasion of Enoatak directly followed the success in the Battle of Kalawa Jin in the Southeast Pacific. To capture Enoatak would provide an airfield and a harbor to support attacks on the Mariana Islands to the northwest. The operation was officially known as Operation Catchpole, and it was a three-phase operation involving the invasion of three main islands in the Enoatak Atoll. This is Marine Corps Private Theodore James Miller. He was assigned to the 22nd Marine Independent Regiment, and soon after, he was given orders to board the USS Arthur Middleton. This attack transport ship was scheduled to arrive at Enoatak Atoll, specifically Engby Island, one of the 40 islands that make up the atoll. In the attack on Engby Island, American losses were 78 killed, 166 wounded, and 7 missing, totaling 251 casualties. All of Engby's defenders were killed, except for 19 Japanese prisoners that were taken in. Although Miller survived, a month later he would be sent to Ebon Atoll in the Pacific, and he was killed during its invasion. Miller was able to take on 25 Japanese soldiers, including six civilians, two women, and two children among them. He was able to put up a 20-minute firefight before he and another Marine were found dead, and eight others were wounded. This photo of James Miller was widely distributed in the United States after Miller's death. It was one of the few photos that were publicly shared that depicted trauma in its rawest form. Theodore isn't crying in this photo. He isn't injured in this photo. He's simply not present in the photo. This is Salma Bashir, and for over 10 years of her life, she has not been able to eat. When Salma was five years old, her family decided to take a quick trip to Egypt, and during that trip, they decided to spend some time at a pool. And because Salma was five years old, she needed to be in the baby pool. At the time, her mother was pregnant, and Salma had an older brother who was also on the trip. Her mother's attention was split in three different directions, and during the moment where she wasn't looking at Salma and watching her play in the pool, something terrible happened. Salma ended up accidentally sitting on the pool's suction valve, and the force was so strong that it tore her intestines from her body before anyone had a chance to pull her away. When asked to recall about this experience, Salma had this to say, I was just swimming all of a sudden. I just sat on it by accident. I know the lifeguard tried to pull me out, but he couldn't because the suction was so much. My dad tried to pull me out, and then I know a couple of people finally were able to get me out, and when I was taken out, it was so traumatic. When Salma's mom came to see what was going on, she was initially confused. Her daughter was screaming in pain, and she couldn't identify what was wrong. The reason being is that Salma was wearing a red swimsuit, and her intestines just looked like torn swimsuit to her mother. When asked about her reaction to Salma's injury, this is what her mother had to say. I found someone carrying her, and all her intestines came out of her body. I couldn't believe that it was intestine. I thought at the beginning it was her swimsuit. After frantically taking her to the nearest hospital, doctors just gave her weeks to live. Fortunately though, Salma was given the opportunity to have a life-saving surgery after her parents crowdfunded 236,000 pounds and waiting over half a year to get a transplant. Unfortunately though, even with the surgery being a success, her body rejected the transplant intestine. And after six grueling months, it had to be removed. At the age of five, she had an open wound on her stomach. It took a long time for that to heal, and she had to dress that wound every single day. Psalm was quoted saying, My stomach was open so bad, we could literally see my insides. It's healing slowly, but now it's not getting healed anymore. It's filled with tissue, so thankfully, you can't really see insides or anything, but it's leaking 24-7. 
To make her feel comfortable, her parents removed her from school and are now homeschooling her. Since the age of five, she's needed a wheelchair to get around, and it's rare that she goes a month without needing to be rushed to hospital. Currently, she's still living in the United States on a medical visa. Her parents have gone on record talking about how expensive it is to maintain her health and how major costs could be negated if her mother was simply allowed to be a doctor in the United States. She's a qualified doctor in her home nation, but that qualification didn't transfer to the United States. As of right now, at the age of 15, Salma requires a transplant. She would need to have five organs replaced, small intestines, large intestines, liver, stomach, and pancreas. And these organ transplants are expensive. Without insurance, five organ transplants cost $3 million. In the meantime, Salma has done a great job of trying to maintain some normalcy in her life. She doesn't want her condition to affect her happiness. In the meantime, while she waits for five organs to become available to her, Salma has to wear a total parental nutrition bag, which is hooked up to her body and gives her all of the necessary nutrients. Her bag typically contains a mixture of sodium, glucose, calcium, and other miscellaneous nutrients that a growing child needs. What do you think happens when you lose control of your car and run it into a house? You might think that's a silly question, because we've all seen a car run into a building. It's a staple in every action movie. I'm sure we all can picture it. So let me ask you a better question. Is what you're currently picturing this? November 8th, 2022. Two people were killed after a car crashed into a home in Park Ridge, Chicago, Tuesday morning. Those who witnessed the crash from their homes or from the street said that it looked like something out of a movie. They also noted that those who were in the car during the crash died instantly. Many of the neighbors report feeling traumatized after seeing the gruesome event. Allegedly, the driver was tearing through the entire neighborhood, cutting through intersection after intersection before completely losing control and plowing into this house. And the only silver lining is that no one was actually living in the house. It had been vacant for a year. I've never seen a car so completely totaled and wedged in a building before. And I'm pretty sure that's why this matriculated to the top of the subreddit. It's raw, it's visceral. This isn't a movie, this isn't a TV show. Two lives were lost. And I can guarantee you, by the way that this car looks, it wasn't an instant death. Whoever these people were, they were suffering until the very end. And whether or not their deaths are the direct result of reckless driving is debatable. There really isn't any information on whether or not they were inebriated, or maybe their car was malfunctioning. Either way, a bunch of people on that street woke up at 11 a.m. to a crash and two mangled dead bodies. According to the United States Department of Transportation, about 32 people in the United States die in drunk driving crashes. That's one person every 45 minutes. In the year 2020, 11,654 people died while driving impaired on alcohol. And unfortunately, this is a 14% increase since 2019. And unfortunately, nearly a majority of these deaths are people who weren't drunk at all. People who were simply driving and were struck by a different vehicle or someone on the street who was struck by a vehicle. This is Cody Lane. She was born on November 28th, 1986 in Louisville, Kentucky. Her home life is relatively unknown. Multiple articles that talk about her infer that maybe she grew up in an impoverished household because of the career path that she decided to go down in her early 20s. Cody Lane is an adult film star and a pretty prominent one. Between the years of 2006 and 2013, she starred in 180 movies and was paid $300,000 over the course of her career. After 2013, Cody Lane decided to pursue a career in the escort industry, and since she was a minor celebrity, she would charge you 1800 bucks an hour for a date. And this was relatively lucrative for her. She was able to support her husband and the child that they share. Many articles that talk about the life of Cody Lane consistently mention how much she treasures her family, how much she loves her husband, and how much she loves her son. Unfortunately though, on December 16th, 2020, Cody Lane was innocently walking home on a sidewalk. While she was crossing the road, a reckless drunk driver hit her. Cody ended up flying and sprawled onto the ground with blood gushing out from her wounds. She was immediately rushed to the hospital and doctors immediately observed that her condition was critical. And unfortunately, it was just too much for her to bear. On January 9th, 2021, she passed away. Her sudden death shocked the entire entertainment industry. It was such a shock that the first ever articles written about Cody Lane after 2013 were articles about her death. She's currently only survived by her husband and son, and the drunk driver that took Cody Lane's life? His whereabouts are unknown, but the decision he made that night is known. 
It was a decision that led to an innocent woman dying in the world's worst way. Ventura County, California, with a population of 843,843, is located west of Los Angeles, and it's known for the fact that it's one of the few places in the United States where you can legally grow cannabis. The county is also known for its low crime rates and above average population of younger people. As a result, there's bars and clubs scattered throughout the county. But there is one bar in particular that is pretty infamous. It's called the Borderline Bar and Grill, and that night they had a promotion. They were hosting line dancing lessons for college students as young as 18. Crowds of young people packed into the bar. Two groups in particular were celebrating their 21st birthdays, and everything was going fine for a little bit, until people started hearing gunfire. During the event, a former U.S. Marine machine gunner who may have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder suddenly burst into the bar, tossed a smoke bomb into the crowd, and started opening fire randomly into the bar. There was nearly a crush at the door with people attempting to escape the building before being injured or killed. Terrified patrons were running out into the street, covering their heads as bullets flew. Immediately after the gunfire, those who were outside of the bar noticed and observed people running out with their phones, calling their loved ones, texting their loved ones. It was pure chaos, on top of the fact that people were calling 911 and nearly jamming up the line because so many calls were being made in such a short period of time. But for as quickly as it began, it stopped. The shooting left 12 people dead and 18 others injured. Some were hurt trying to escape, and the severity of their injuries were not immediately known. Once police officers arrived on the scene and were able to control the crowd and enter the bar safely, they noticed that the suspected gunman, Ian David Long, was already dead. Initially, the police officers didn't know how David Long died. There was so much blood on the floor, they couldn't determine where it came from. They didn't know if it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound or if another police officer was able to get him by firing through the bar from the outside. Once police officers were sure that the threat was handled, multiple local news organizations converged on the scene. They quickly interviewed as many people as they could. One person in particular, named Nellie Wong, was able to give her account to the Los Angeles Times. She was celebrating her 21st birthday at the bar, and as the shooting started, she immediately dived to the floor and hid behind a group of tables and bar stools, squeezing her nose closed with her hand to avoid choking on the smoke. I immediately stopped moving, stopped breathing, said Wong, who still wore a bright pink cowboy hat and a happy birthday sash. Thank goodness he didn't see me at all. It wouldn't take long for police officers and detectives to figure out the gunman's background. Ian Long was 28 years old, and he lived in Newbury Park, five miles away from the dance hall, and he drove his mother's red Toyota pickup to the borderline and didn't say anything before opening fire. Long had an extensive background as a machine gunner in the U.S. Marine Corps, reaching the rank of corporal. He served a seven-month tour in Afghanistan during his nearly five years in the service, and once he completed his five years, his neighbors noted a change in his demeanor and suspected that he had emotional problems. It's important to note that Ian was already on the police department's radar. Deputies were called to Long's home in April of 2018 to respond to a complaint made by a neighbor, the complaint being that he was irate and acting irrationally. But the mental health workers that were dispatched with the deputies said that he did not meet the standard for an emergency psychiatric hold. There was no clear motive for the shooting, but there is a reason. Ian was incredibly mentally ill, suffering with PTSD and potentially schizophrenia, and for whatever reason, triggered by his severe mental illness, Ian decided to kill 12 innocent people, two of which are pictured in this photo. Telemachus Orfanos, who's pictured with the black beanie in the back, lifting a beer, and Brandon Kelly, who's also in the back of the photo and wearing a cap, were murdered by Ian Long that night. And this photo was taken moments before Ian decided to kick in the door, throw in a smoke bomb, and shoot 12 random people. After a month, the entire scene was broken down. Detectives and deputies were able to establish every single movement that Ian Long made that night. And the analysis begins with the photo. It was taken seven minutes before Ian walked into the building and started firing. Immediately after the firing began, seven people hid in the attic, seven people hid in the kitchen bathroom, and others shattered windows to escape. Officers found Long's body in the office, and he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. That night, 75 people did survive, either by hiding or simply escaping through the windows. The shooting could have been a lot worse, because apparently there was 175 people packed into the bar. So it's almost a miracle that the majority of people who were at the bar that night, who had their lives threatened, were able to escape and survive. But unfortunately, this isn't the end of the story. The two men who died, who are shown in this photograph, were actually involved in a different shooting. The infamous Las Vegas shooting 
in 2017. They both survived that shooting by escaping or hiding, and they both shared the same tattoo commemorating the fact that they survived. And if you look to the far right at Brandon Kelly's left arm, you can partially see their shared tattoo. A tattoo that was captured in a picture that was taken only seven minutes before another masked gunman came in and took their lives. The observable universe is approximately 93 billion light years in diameter, and within the observable universe, there's about 100 to 200 billion galaxies. And when it comes to planets, there's 10 to the 30 that fit within those 93 billion light years. I think it's safe to say that there has to be other living organisms in the universe. We can't be alone. But it's still a privilege to have the ability to create sentient, conscious life. And ironically, that life is incredibly improbable. You and I share a similar probability of being here. One and four quadrillion. That's the probability of a sperm meeting the right egg. And with that being said, with you understanding just how special and improbable you are, and how much of a privilege it is to be here, to share the human experience, and also have the opportunity to create another life. Let's talk about this couple. Their names are Taylor Blaha, 24, and Brendan Toma, 31. And I'm going to tell you the story of not only how they squandered their lives, but how they destroyed another's life. On November 16th of this year, Taylor Blaha gave birth to a little girl. Unfortunately, Taylor wasn't prepared to be a parent. She was willing to give the child up to a social worker, and she was on the phone that day with one. But then suddenly, plans changed. Taylor quickly hung up the phone with the human resources worker because her baby girl began to cry. This was a problem for Taylor and Brandon because they were habitual meth users, and they didn't want anybody to call the cops about a crying baby because they don't want the cop to discover the fact that they're high on meth and that their child, their newborn little girl, was exposed to methamphetamine as well, most likely during pregnancy. Taylor was afraid that she would lose her child, along with her two-year-old son, because of her illegal drug use and their exposure to illegal drugs. So Brandon and Taylor decided to drown the baby in the bathtub, and this act of violence was moments after the child was born. The child was barely alive for a few hours. And they did this to make sure that the police won't come over and ask any questions about their meth use or why their child, their two-year-old son, was exposed to illegal drugs. Strangely enough, after the gruesome murder of their newborn daughter, the couple decided to keep portions of her umbilical cord in a drawer as a keepsake. After Brandon made sure that the child was deceased, he started planning on how to dispose of the body. He first placed the newborn in a plastic container and then wrapped that container in multiple plastic bags and finally stuffing all of that into a black backpack. Brandon chose to not immediately leave the apartment with the body. Instead, he placed everything into the backpack and put the backpack somewhere in the apartment and just left the body there for a little bit. Hours would pass. And during that time, Brandon decided to dispatch the body outside of the apartment. While texting his girlfriend, he told her that he would dispose of the body in some woods outside of the town near a bridge named Kenyon Road Bridge. And this was an interesting decision, because that bridge is known to all of those who lived in Fort Dodge, Iowa, where this crime took place. It's a small town, which means everyone, from normal civilians all the way to police officers, will have an easy time finding this baby. And when Taylor started to feel guilty about what she did and turned herself in, the police were immediately searching the woods near the bridge, just like the text messages said. But unfortunately, the baby was not found. Detectives tried to pull out any additional information out of Brandon during the interview process, but that didn't work out. Taylor, on the other hand, was the first to come to the police, and she had a lot to say about her feelings concerning her daughter. She told investigators that she did not intend to keep the baby and planned on allowing her sister to adopt the child. But this wasn't true. Once the police department analyzed her and her boyfriend's phones, there were evidence of multiple different searches for how to miscarry a baby. This confused both the police officers and the news organizations covering this story. How can this couple be so adamant about not wanting to have a child to such an extent that they're searching up ways to have a miscarriage, but at the same time, they're fearful that their child would be taken away by government officials if they were to find out that both of them were strung out on meth. And that there was the primary motivation to kill their child. There hasn't been a trial yet, but both of them are being charged with first degree murder and the death of their newborn daughter. But recently, Thomas received an additional charge for abuse of a corpse. 
both Brandon and Taylor, are currently being held in the Webster County Jail on cash-only bonds. Brandon's bail is set at $1,050,000, and Taylor's bail is set at $1 million. This is Maria Masha Bruschina. She was born in Belarus in 1924 and lived most of her life with her mother in Minsk. As a child, both her mother and teachers acknowledged that she was an avid reader and a quick learner. Over time, she would get familiar with the Communist Manifesto and align herself with that ideology. She would soon join the Vladimir Lenin All-Union Pioneer Organization. Over time, the organization would change its name to the Young Pioneers, and it was a mass youth organization of the Soviet Union for children and adolescents aged between 9 and 14 that existed between 1922 and 1991. The organization functioned a lot like scouting organizations do in the West, like the Boy Scouts of America and the Girl Scouts of America, and Marsha enjoyed it as a child, eventually going going on to join the Commissole, which is a similar Leninist youth organization, but instead of teaching children skills, it taught children how to become a potential member of the Communist Party. Her ambition didn't go unnoticed. In December of 1938, the newspaper Pioneer of Belarus published a photograph of Masha with the caption, Masha Berskina, the schoolgirl of 8th grade in school number 28, Minsk. She only has good and excellent marks in all subjects. For the remainder of her childhood and through her teenage years, she leaned into her studies and ultimately graduated from Minsk Secondary School in 1941. Over time, she developed an interest in becoming a nurse, so she began to volunteer at the hospital at the Minsk Polytechnic Institute, which had been set up to care for wounded soldiers of the Red Army. During her time at the hospital, she helped Red soldiers escape by smuggling civilian clothing and false identity papers into the hospital. A patient told the Germans what Burskina was doing, and she was arrested on October 14, 1941. She would be transferred between the German 707th Infantry Division to the Lithuanian Auxiliary Troops, and after being placed in their custody, Marsha began writing a letter to her mother. The letter was penned on October 20th, 1941. I am tormented by the thought that I have caused you great worry. Don't worry, nothing bad has happened to me. I swear to you that you will have no further unpleasantness because of me. If you can, please send me my dress, my green blouse, and white socks. I want to be dressed decently when I leave here. Some time passes after Marsha sent her letter to her mom. At this point, German officials are contemplating on what to do with her. They decided on an execution, a public execution. They wanted to make an example out of Marcia, along with two other members of the resistance, a 16-year-old named Voldia and a World War I veteran named Kirill. Before being hanged, she was paraded through the streets with a placard around her neck, which read in both Russian and German, we are partisans and we have shot at German troops. That statement wasn't true, but it didn't matter. This was a show of power. It was meant to instill fear in the citizens of Minsk, but that's not what happened. On Sunday, October 26, 1941, Marsha was hanged publicly, and at that very moment, she became a martyr. There were many witnesses to the execution. One eyewitness account in particular was recorded. When they put her on the stool, the girl turned her face towards the fence. The executioners wanted her to stand with her face towards the crowd, but she turned away, and that was that. No matter how much they pushed her and tried to turn her, she remained standing with her back to the crowd. Only then did they kick away the stool from under her. For decades after the war, Burskina was officially referred to as the unknown girl, allegedly due to anti-Semitism from Soviet authorities. Up to 2009, Marsha's name was not present at the memorial plaque where many members of the resistance were executed. But once people realized her name was absent, by the end of the year, they added it to the plaque. An additional monument for Burskina was erected in Israel, and a street was named after her in Jerusalem. Hello everyone, it's your boy, Aileris, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below and leave a like if you liked the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe, fam. What you doing watching videos and not subscribing? And if you're old, make sure you hit that bell so you can get these notifications every time. I apologize for the delay. I really meant to upload all of the content I promised on Sunday, but the content just wasn't good enough. I wanted to make sure that today's two uploads were spectacular, and I genuinely hope that I delivered on that for you. This video series is a channel favorite, and it deserves attention, along with the other video that will be uploaded an hour after this one. Also, another big announcement is that on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, there will also be double uploads of more channel favorites. I chose to take the past three days to really, you know, <laughs> sit in my chair and not move and make sure that you guys could get the content that you deserve. And as always, I gotta thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. 
A big thank you to Lucas Adams, Big Boy Bailey, Primavera, BMX30, Walinda, Ouija Baby, Cinnamon Sticks, Crush40 Legacy Gamer, Scott, Rivka, Lightstar, Samantha Bellhart, Admin Faneker, Zach F, Darth Titan, Keeley, Dunder Has Hawk, Viva LaRue, Nobs, Lady Laughs A Lot, Swiss Patreon user, Noah, and Catherine Taylor, thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one to my merch store and one to my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.